I wanted to show you a little bit about uh, the, our implementation monitoring strategy. Uh, I will address a couple of things, laboratory markers, cascade of care, and some of the more novel work that we're doing regarding phylogenetic mapping. The first one relates to a paper that uh, we published in uh, Lancet ID in uh, January this year. And basically what it does is illustrate for you the cascade of care. Uh, we find this a very useful tool to understand what's happening in the province, where the gaps are uh, for those that are uh, uh, in infected, diagnosed, uh, linked, retained, on heart, adhering, and suppressed. And if you can map this uh, province-wide, and this is the pro province-wide data, uh, then you have an opportunity to understand, are things getting better? Uh, and if not, what are, the, what are the gaps and, and what strategies we can bring to bear to make this better? Before I go back to the cascade, uh, I want to show you some uh, biological markers uh, to give you a sense where things are going. Based on CD4 count at uh, entry into the uh, drug treatment program, it has gone up steadily over the last decade. Uh, uh, you notice that the number of people that are uh, uh, entering into treatment or are entering into treatment uh, with advanced disease is very small, and we increasingly have people uh, with more than 350 and, and yet with more than 500 cells uh, who are initiating therapy. So the, the, the campaign as a whole uh, is moving things in the right direction. Uh, uh, there have been concerns regarding potential for decreasing adherence as we engage more people into treatment uh, and necessarily more people with social challenges uh, or cultural challenges or other challenges, comorbidities, for example, are entering into treatment. And as you can see here, uh, the rates of adherence actually are going up, not down, uh, in the last decade. As a result of that, uh, in this panel, I show you uh, plasma viral load in British Columbia for everybody who has ever had a viral load down, whether or not on treatment. So this is the closest you're going to get to the picture of the community viral load. And what it shows is that uh, most people are currently uh, undetectable on the shades of green. Uh, fewer people are uh, detectable. Uh, on the shades of uh, red and orange. And, and among those that are detectable, uh, the amount of virus that is circulating in the community is actually less in the, in the sense that people with high viremia, the, 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 the deeper uh, red there or orange, uh, is actually uh, getting less and less and less. Currently, people uh, over 50,000 copies represent about 20% uh, in contrast to uh, uh, what it used to be 45% in 1996. And as a corollary of this, what you see here is that antiretroviral therapy uh, resistance in our community has decreased steadily. Uh, and so the majority of the people are wild type, very few have significant resistance, and most importantly, multiple drug resistance, which used to be my day-to-day -day clinical preoccupation, has virtually disappeared. Uh, I have family doctors running the antiretroviral therapy clinic uh, when I used to spend my days in the clinic because I could not delegate that work to anybody else. Uh, it used to be a nightmare. And today, it is a pleasure. So going back to the cascade of care, uh, I, I'll show you some of the newer work that we're doing. This work is in preparation. Uh, we have taken the cascade of care, and, and we're starting to um, um, uh, uh, look at it uh, stratified by various characteristics. Uh, in this case, for example, by health authority. We have five health authorities in the province, and, and what this does, it helps you immediately to understand that health authority number five there, uh, whatever that is, uh, it has a problem. Uh, they are not performing up to par with the rest. So it, as a director of the program for the province, allows me to go back to the health authority number five and say, Ladies and gentlemen, we have a problem here. We need to fix this. Uh, and you have a gap specifically uh, on uh, the number of people on treatment, and among those, the number of that hearing, and among those, the, the ones that are suppressed. So let's get to work on that particular area. Now, that's too simplistic. Uh, uh, there is uh, a lot more information in the casket of care that can be extracted. Uh, and just, I'll just show you an example. Uh, here you have casket of care by gender. Uh, so you have men and women, and uh, it would be You'll be tempted to say uh, women are not doing so well, but then you, you, can, you can break this down further uh, and look at it by age at the time of testing, and you see how age is playing a major role. Uh, and in fact, I didn't include it here, but if you combine, say, MSM and age, you find that the gap among the young MSM is huge. So uh, what, what, what this is helping, uh, helping us to do is to 
identify not just geographic areas where we may have a problem, but actually subgroups that may need different strategies in order to address their, their ongoing needs. And this work, as I said, is ongoing, uh, but the, the, our next sort of focus is to use this stratified casket of care uh, to help us allocate resources more uh, uh, effectively, smartly, uh, in terms of uh, getting a, a greater return for, for the investment. The next thing that I'm going to show you is the phylogenetic mapping uh, that we're doing in BC, which uh, I, ha I think has the, the potential to revolutionize uh, the way that we uh, track this epidemic. What you see here is a map of all of the viruses in British Columbia. Uh, uh, resistance testing in BC is fully funded and is part of the standard of care. So when we get a viral load uh, in a person that never had a viral load before, that viral load is going to be uh, run for genotype uh, because that's a sort of mandatory part of the care. We cannot conceive of people walking around not knowing if the virus is resistant or not, uh, and then they have to make decisions regarding treatment. Uh, so this is no questions asked. Of course, evidence that treatment works in terms of prevention uh, is not just coming from Vancouver. Uh, there is now a randomized controlled trial uh, published in 2011 uh, that showed definitively that when you treat somebody infected with HIV, the likelihood of transmission, heterosexual transmission of that virus uh, decreases by 96%. Uh, notice that there was only one case of HIV transmission in that study in the, in the immediate arm of the study, in the people that were treated, and that case occurred uh, shortly after the patient was randomized, uh, and quite clearly before the treatment uh, had an opportunity to render that individual's virus undetectable. So if you were to consider this on, as an on-treatment analysis, uh, uh, meaning after the patient has been uh, adequately treated for a period of time, you will conclude that the HVTN of I2 actually shows that antiretroviral therapy has the potential of being 100% effective uh, in decreasing HIV transmission. People don't uh, remember very uh, frequently the fact that in that trial as well, even though the primary endpoint and the power was e exclusively uh, calculated around HIV transmission, uh, there was evidence of the clinical benefit uh, uh, between the immediate and deferred arm. And the immediate arm uh, had a 41% reduction of uh, morbidity mortality endpoints uh, and an 84% reduction of extrapulmonary tuberculosis. So all of this discussion about whether earlier treatment uh, is worth it is, uh, in my opinion, uh, is really a waste of time. Uh, people have said that treatment prevention may not work in the developing world. So I'm happy to add for you a uh, big paper uh, from Frank Tanser uh, from KwaZulu Natal, uh, who looked at the issue of uh, the impact of rolling out antiretroviral therapy on HIV transmission uh, uh, in the, their area, in the area of Durban, uh, close to Durban. And what they do, I'm not going to go into the details here, is they map very elegantly uh, on the green antiretroviral therapy coverage between 2005 and 2011, and on the blue maps uh, at, at this, at, during the same period of time, HIV prevalence. Uh, and then they basically plotted them together, and they were able to show that uh, areas where there was more coverage, higher degree of coverage with antiretroviral therapy, had lower uh, likelihood of HIV transmission. And, and the remarkable thing is that their mathematical model uh, uh, gave exactly the same uh, uh, level of association that we saw in British Columbia. In our hands, for every 1% increase in the number of people that are virologically suppressed in British Columbia, we have a 1% decrease in the number of new infections. One for one. In their case, they concluded that a 30% coverage was associated with a 30 to 40% decrease in HIV transmission or likelihood of HIV transmission. We could not fake it any better. <laughs> and yet we cannot convince uh, health authorities across the country that this is worth their time and their money. And this is particularly true uh, when it comes to the federal government. I have met, met and written to the federal government every year since 2006, all the way to Tony Clement and Leona Aglukak and the more recent uh, 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 newbie in the uh, Ministry of Health, and Ron Ambrose has no time for me. And Stephen Harper has no time for us. 
Why? Because he doesn't care. Because we don't vote conservative no matter what he does. And at the end of the day, he's kind of conservative anyways. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, that's all he cares about. But in the meantime, I have to tell you that the worst epidemic in this country is among First Nations. And that is a squarely a federal responsibility. So we cannot let go of this issue. We need you, every single one of you, to be writing letters to the feds starting today saying you are uh, uh, not attending to your responsibility. Uh, this epidemic is within your uh, 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 strict mandate, and you should be doing something about it. And the public needs to know about it. If we do that, that alone will change the course of the epidemic, because the Saskatchewan epidemic that you see here on the orange is driven 70% by new infections among First Nation individuals. And the Manitoba epidemic, which is the other one that is totally out of control, uh, is 40%. Uh, First Nations. BC has problems with First Nations as well, and we're strongly trying to contain that. But, but the, the reality is that if we address the needs of the First Nations, we are going to have an impact on the epidemic at large, and we're going to send, set a framework for the rest of the country to move in that direction. Uh, it goes without saying that uh, British Columbia has had the greatest and uh, most sustained decrease in HIV new, new, new infections. Uh, uh, Ontario is probably second um, I think you could do better. Um, and the world, finally, is coming around to this notion. The antiretroviral therapy guidelines for the developing nations of the world have finally embraced treatment and prevention. WHO presented this in Vancouver in 2013. Uh, it actually went formally forward with this uh, at the Kuala Lumpur conference. And when I have asked them, the federal government to, to endorse the WHO guidelines, they say, oh, we're not interested. This is a provincial jurisdiction. No, sir. If this was flu or H1N1 or any other virus that you find uh, socially, socially acceptable, uh, you would actually be all over it. But because it's HIV, you don't care. So w w how come this country doesn't endorse, at the minimum, the WHO guidelines? I don't care if the provinces want to do more, but they cannot do less. This is a recommendation for Africa. And we have jurisdictions in this country that do not endorse these recommendations. The WHO has actually estimated the potential impact that these recommendations would have in the epidemic, uh, in this case, for low and middle income countries. And you can see these two curves are actually uh, very spectacular. Uh, they show the uh, accumulative uh, uh, effect on death on your left-hand side, and the cumulative uh, effect on the infections averted on your right-hand side, uh, remarkable uh, impact. And you probably wonder by now, you know, why in, when is he going to talk about something else? Uh, about PrEP, for example. Uh, there have been so many clinical trials, beautiful, uh, excellent, wonderful journals, and lovely grants, and all of that. Uh, well, let, let me make a long story short. I, I think PrEP is a distraction. When you talk about PrEP, uh, you're basically chasing a, a, a group of people out there that you don't know who they are. Uh, you're investing resources, you're diluting your resources, pursuing people that may be at risk today but not tomorrow, and as the trial has shown, uh, this intervention is only partially effective. On the other hand, when you talk about treatment prevention, you're optimizing your investment. Uh, people who are infected with HIV, whether you like it or not, they will need antiretroviral therapy sooner rather than later. And by doing this now, we, we, we get better responses, better tolerability, better performance, and we stop an epidemic without any additional investment. So at a time of fiscal constraint, we need to be very smart where we put our resources. And I will say that from a public health perspective, treatment prevention is the way to go. I'm not against PrEP, don't get me wrong. Uh, uh, we can use it. In fact, we often use it. But, but that's a boutique indication. PrEP is not going to stop this epidemic. We got to be smart, and treatment and prevention is the way to do it. And let me show you this uh, analysis that we did, did with UNH and WHO, which illustrates the point. What we did here, if we compare in low and middle income countries, the potential impact of not doing anything, continuing the 2011 uh, antiretroviral therapy guidelines, or the, at that time, proposed, now accepted, 2013 WHO guidelines uh, on the first green line that you see there. And then we said, look, let's model on top of that 
a hypothetical prep that can, that can be 90% uh, effective all the time and that is simple and everybody takes, and then add to that a vaccine that doesn't exist that is 90% effective. And that's the incremental benefit that you get uh, by if you were to have those. That makes my point. Now, I'm cheating a little bit uh, because I said the optimal implementation of the proposed 2013 WHO guidelines. And of course, for as long as people like Stephen Harper uh, pay no interest to any of these, uh, optimal, nothing. And so for as long as we do not do optimal, nothing, uh, then there is lots of room for improvement with whatever you want. Uh, but what we need to understand is that the current 2013 WHO guidelines give us the best and most effective and cost-effective opportunity to actually do the job and do it today with the tools that we have available today. And this, we've been saying this for years, but now we have the data. We had the modeling, we had the randomized control trials. So let me go back to 1996. I told you earlier, I showed you the 1996 data, and I told you the story, how things came about, so that you understand the difference. In 1996, there was urgency. Why? Because people were sick in the streets of Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, and the like. Today, uh, politicians can't afford to ignore the whole thing because new infections don't hurt. And mortality, you know, is lower anyways. And morbidity is better anyways. And that's not good enough. We have a Made in Canada strategy that has been adopted globally, and Canada is still thinking about it and asking for more data. I meet with PHAC every year, and they say, yes, but you have not definitely demonstrated uh, that treatment is what is doing it. And I say, well, I don't care. I'm just going to finish the epidemic, retire, and you guys are going to continue asking questions, uh, and nothing is going to get done at the national level. Uh, I met Bill Clinton in Toronto after my, my, my plenary here when I proposed treatment prevention. Uh, he was completely sold out, completely sold. He, he bought it, uh, and, 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 and basically he said, I want to help you. And he did. In 2008, he talked to the Wall Street Journal, and he said, 2008. He said, we should be doing what Dr. Montana says. And the economists, within days, wrote it up, and the economists didn't get enough traction, so they wrote it again. And they're not a liberal or, or a, a socialist uh, journal, in case you don't know who they are. Uh, so they did it for a very good reason, because they understood that this is a very sound business proposition in every aspect. Eventually, uh, in 2010, Michel Silibe, the executive director of uh, UNAIDS, uh, did a side visit to Vancouver. He was keen to find out exactly what we were doing. And from Vancouver, he actually launched a campaign Zero new infections, treatment for everyone who needs it. Didn't take much for him to understand that this was the way forward. And he's been a terrific supporter ever since. Eventually, President Obama uh, uh, began to talk about the beginning of the end of AIDS in December 1st, 2011, uh, whereby uh, treatment prevention is a central part of the strategy for PEPFAR and for domestic a HIV. And President Clinton uh, continues to be our biggest advocate him and Stephen Lewis, I must say, at the domestic level. And I must confess that we've been incredibly lucky and that uh, our political support has been unwavering because, to be honest with you, uh, my government, my liberal government, doesn't get too many votes because of the work that we do. But they actually realize that this is good for the people and it's good for the economy. Uh, Gordon Campbell used to tell me, Julio, I'm going to call the program the three Ps. This is good for the patients, this is good for the public health, and this is good for the public purse. What is there not to like? I said, Premier, I think it, may, it could be good for politics too, but uh, that didn't work for him. <laughs> France announced adoption of treatment prevention as a federal policy October 3rd, 2013. Brazil announced it October 17th, 2013. Next month, no, this, in a week, in a, it, it, this month, uh, on the 17th, I'm going to be in Panama formally announcing uh, with the federal government in Panama uh, the launching of criminal prevention in the first Caribbean nation in Panama. So this is happening everywhere. The question is, why is it not happening in Canada? And it's your job to do it because I've I done it for BC and I'm here exclusively to recruit your support so we can make it happen in the rest of the country. The end of AIDS is in sight. We could be the first country to actually deliver on the promise. And it's not just the end of AIDS, because the end of AIDS is easy. I'm talking about the end of HIV and AIDS as we know it. The choice is ours, and hopefully you can help us to deliver on the promise. Thank you.